I think Gen Z, or basically people from ages 15 to 25, are the first generation in our records that hate themselves more than they're hated by their elders. Today's young people have been shoved into several cruel social experiments, the effects of which we're seeing bear fruit today. Gen Z is an enigma. It has some of the most and least motivated people inside of it, some of the most ideological and cynical, and definitely very polarized in every single way. These are the three key factors I think you need to understand to figure out the current generation of young people, and thus the leaders of the future. So many of our media institutions are controlled by boomers and present a narrative that seems out of touch with people my age. On top of this, social media platforms like Facebook give clearly biased and censored news. With information so tightly controlled, it's difficult to find ways of getting information that isn't marred by political biases. But that's where Ground News comes in. Ground News is an app that makes sure you get the full picture by presenting stories from both sides of the political spectrum. And they have lots of ways to help you beyond that, including showing stories one or both sides aren't paying attention to, and gathering news from all over the globe. Ground News is great and helps me to get a full picture of the world, especially with events like the war in Ukraine going on. Ground News is invaluable in making sure I'm seeing all the moving gears that are operating in the world right now. If you want a better way to stay informed, then click the link in the description and get a better understanding of the world with Ground News today. I consider myself lucky to be in an especially privileged position to make this video, since I'm one of the very, very few people that are both professional historians and in this age group. I'm only 20 years old, but I also dropped out of college to run this channel full-time, and I run a consulting business where I work with high-level CEOs, politicians, and thinkers. Even though I'm not college-educated, I am a professional historian, while also having lived through the Gen Z experience firsthand. When you're looking at Gen Z, you're looking at an experiment of what happens when you shove one of the healthiest and most successful societies in all of history through a meat grinder or some of the most bizarre and crude social situations of all time. Due to this, we're seeing the fraying of what was, even in my childhood, a decently healthy society, and seeing it gradually slide into barbarism. I will go through the three external factors that I think made Gen Z what it is, and in so doing try to understand the core of this generation and how I think it will influence our society going forward. Also, this video's biased towards North America, since it's a society I understand. This sort of topic is pretty slippery, since it hasn't been studied or written down in history books, since it's still going on as we speak. I don't really understand the experiences of the Brazilian, European, or Chinese youth, since I haven't lived them in a way where I can grasp their essence. However, since we live in a globalized world, I'm sure a significant part of what I say will carry over to those societies. Part 1. Competition in a lot of ways, this video feels more like a personal rehash of my Why is the World Crazy video, but on a more personal, local basis, given that the factors that are messing up the modern world are the same that are destroying North America's youth. However, the first factor is overcompetition for the basic things that make people happy in life. Sigmund Freud, when asked what a person needs to live a decent life, says they need to be able to work and love. Later psychological studies say that some of the things that make people the happiest is if they feel in tune with their work and their loving relationships. However, due to macroeconomic trends, Gen Z is really getting neither. In 1950, it would take over two years of average income to buy a house. Now we're at over 20. In real terms, standard of living has declined precipitously since the 70s. The cost of education has gone up 20 times since 1970, and per capita spending on healthcare has gone up seven times since 1970. The example I've given earlier that I think is still powerful is that in the 1980s, Homer Simpson was considered a lower middle class loser for holding a steady job with a stay-at-home wife, three kids, and the ability to go on vacation regularly. That standard of living is impossible for basically any young people today. The driving factor behind this isn't any particular group like the right or left, the banks, or ethnic minorities, but instead macroeconomic trends that are affecting the whole world and that we've seen dozens of times across history before. The short answer is that a bunch of factors including population growth, globalization, immigration, automation, and women entering the workforce has grown the labor pool faster than the need for labor. I'm not saying all of these processes were bad, many of them were good, but everything, no matter how positive, has negative effects. Individual productivity has gone up 70% since the 1970s, but the pressures on labor have been getting greater, which means that wages have become worse. In other words, if you're a young American entering the economy today rather than the 1950s, you're competing against twice as many total people in your country due to natural population growth, and on top of that, tens of millions of immigrants, nearly twice as many people due to women entering the workforce, as well as billions of cheaper workers in places like China, Mexico, or Malaysia. 
The dominant mythic ideological system of our times, one which has economists, the media, and much of the intellectual world behind it, is of free trade liberalism which says that this is inherently impossible, confusing total GDP growth stats with standard of living. Importing immigrants or globalizing the economy means total growth for the nation's economy, but the market isn't Santa Claus that automatically gives the best results to everyone. I consider the idea that expanding the labor pool would have universally positive effects a total corruption and co-op by the upper classes as a covert form of class warfare. I want to make clear that this isn't anything special, and this exact sort of thing where globalization and population growth devalue the value of labor has happened dozens of times before across history. The sad thing that I've talked about ad nauseum before on this channel is that these periods almost always end in a nasty combination of civil and international wars and plagues. This class struggle is the cause of the political polarization and agony we see today. Young people are stuck at the losing side of this giant change in economic order. America's economy has been bifurcated between the intellectual elite and proletariat. The economy is split between the haves, or those that have capital, and those that do not. This is since labor is so cheap that the people who can mobilize labor through money have immense leverage. For reasons I've mentioned in this video, the economic order is exceptionally unstable and will collapse, but it's what we have now. This bifurcation for young people generally comes in two forms of a far larger group of dispossessed lower class and an overworked upper class. I saw an interesting statistical analysis where hours worked per person has generally stayed constant in America over the last couple decades, but for the worst possible reasons. This is since the lower classes work fewer hours since the only things they can sell is their manual labor, working at places like Burger King or Walmart, which are interchangeable. Due to American law, you're incentivized to have people work not a lot of hours, so you don't have to give them health care as an employer. However, once you remove the middle tier of jobs like good paying industrial jobs and the like, it creates a hopeless class of people who have no ladder upwards. These people don't have enough money to ever really start families, and are always worrying about money, with little failings in their lives having the potential to push them over the edge. Meritocracy has collapsed precipitously in America. As an example, 60% of the people in top universities are from the top 1% of families, and this is the era of the lowest social mobility in all of American history. I don't think this is due to implicit classism, but instead, as opportunities shrink, those with the best upbringings and backgrounds make the very competitive cutoffs. With the chances of ever improving going away, it makes the lives of the lower classes seem even more hopeless. This is a different kind of poverty than what you see in third world nations. This is people whose parents were middle class and were promised wealth and success from the American system. These are people who expect far better and go on the TV and social media and see immense wealth. That's so much more dangerous than people who are dirt poor in third world countries but slightly wealthier than their parents. Another important thing to consider is that we've seen an unprecedented collapse in social communities of lower class Americans over the last few decades. We've seen a collapse in social ties with massive rises in fatherlessness, crime, abuse, and drug use among lower class Americans. 40% of working class Americans have experienced a serious amount of childhood drama. This was a trend that started in the black community in the 60s and then over the decades spread to other races. Although upper-class people face far less struggles, they face notable and different struggles nonetheless. The main trend of the last few decades in American demographics has been concentrations of higher amounts of capital in fewer hands. This competition for fewer and fewer good jobs means that upper-class Americans are stuck in rife competition, working long hours, competing harshly. For example, Harvard's acceptance rate went from over 20% in the 70s to 4% today. To get an understanding of how rife competition is, a good friend of mine is two degrees from Harvard, but she's still worried about the job market. Young elite people, if you want to call them that, are often living in overcrowded cities with very high rents and can't afford to have children. It's depressing to see so many young people build their identities around their occupations, eschewing interpersonal relationships or forming families for working more. However, this is what you need to believe to succeed in the modern corporate world. Older folks really don't understand how bad it is for young people. I was talking with a boomer and millennial friend about a recession and possible high inflation. The boomer said that if there was a recession, society would just trundle along, while the millennial and I said that most younger folks are already close to subsistence, and so if the cost of living would go up, it would probably result in riots and revolution. As my own private example of this, I was never an academically successful kid in school. I was pretty alienated and didn't have the mindset to work super hard to get the results that people from other conditions or with other minds would get pretty easily. 
At this point, I got some of the best advice in my life from my dad, who's an economic historian, who told me, we live in a capitalist society, and so you just need to accumulate skills, and society will eventually pay you for one. Alongside to this, he said, Rudyard, you'll need to find your own path in life, carving it yourself, but I'll know you'll do it. At that point, I basically grinded in proving my channel and skills, and that eventually paid off to the degree that college didn't make any sense anymore. However, this brings up the main point that the only successful people who live decent lives now are those that are self-employed, whether in jobs like YouTubers or as CEOs. If you're in the corporate world as a young person, even with a lot of skills and advanced degree, you're still interchangeable. My advice for young people is to get skills so you can negotiate for yourself in the market without a boss. The irony is that my path paid off far better than school, which I used to care a tremendous amount about, and the people I admire the most on that path are now on the road to corporate drudgery. The people who I have the most admiration for in our generation are all college dropouts. If it gives you the smallest degree of comfort, these current conditions can't last. We're in the era of the highest debt and money printing levels of any time in history. Economic conditions like this across history always result in financial and social collapses and normally civil wars. But realistically, after that, we're in good shape. America also regularly goes through economic crises every 40 years or so, so this is something normal that we'll eventually work through. However, on the positive side, we're already seeing the fastest growth in bottom tier wages since the 1960s over the last five years, and I expect that to gradually percolate up through the population. As well as productivity gains, and the economy is still on a fundamentally sound footing, meaning there is light at the end of the tunnel. Part 2. Digitization to add on top of this overcompetition came one of the greatest technological revolutions of all time, crushing a beleaguered generation that already had so much to deal with. Maybe in better times the information revolution would have been an unalloyed good. However, in a society that could already barely deal with its problems, the effects mixed good with bad. Having me hate on the internet would be complete hypocrisy considering that it allows me to exist in my current form. We all understand the positive of the internet, given that it makes digital transactions so much easier, makes communication better, and allows us to watch so many endless funny comedies and educational videos. However, all things in the world of men come to sin, and so the best thing when it becomes big creates problems. This happened with the internet. The main problem we see with the internet is that it's inherently addictive. The internet combines immense ease, convenience, and dopamine, with the apps literally designed in Silicon Valley to be addictive. This means that we're more controlled by our technologies than vice versa. There's a fascinating book called Bowling Alone about how social connections have declined in America since the 1950s. It was a book written in the 90s, but the thesis has become even more true since. The biggest factor that the author found for the collapse in social connections was the rise of television, but the internet in effect put that process on steroids. Remember that before television, basically the only way to entertain yourself was to play cards and drink with friends. It's become a collective problem where people don't go out since they're watching Netflix or on Instagram, and then since no one socializes, no one makes social events since people don't show up. Social groups like churches and the like have fallen apart partially due to the immense stress that the competitive economic conditions mentioned above produce, but also due to digital addiction. The amount of Americans with friends is collapsing precipitously, with for example 27% of millennials having no friends, and close to 80% of Gen Z feeling lonely on a normal basis. You have to remember that the key thing here is that humans are an inherently eusocial species, and that we need social connections to remain sane, and it's often the thing that makes us the happiest in life. Thus when we lose social connections, we're losing the strength that holds society together. I mean, look at the incel goth or other dissatisfied youth cultures as well as school shooters. Is it a coincidence about youths not knowing how the world works and confusion came about after the rise of television, and social ties decayed to the degree so that young people weren't appropriately socialized and didn't know how to interact with society? Lots of young people are missing the necessary volume of social connection to teach them how to interact with society, thus creating a bad cycle in which the few social interactions people have are depressed and weird since other people aren't being properly socialized, meaning people want to socialize less. Something to keep in mind is that all of this hits girls far harder, who have sky-high and rising rates of depression. I do not envy girls in today's society, for whom social media becomes a place for non-stop social competition and judgment, and who are hit harder by the decays in social communities. A solid majority of girls I know have at least one mental health problem, like depression, severe anxiety, or the like. It reminds me of how many native peoples like the North American Indians interacted to the introduction of alcohol, in which they had no social conditions to control the substance, thus resulting in mass alcoholism and the collapse of their social codes, and so many young men becoming drunkards. 
We also have the precedent of drug abuse whenever we hit those competition cycles seen before, with alcohol, hashish, and opium being the normal suspects. Probably the most important effect of these digital problems is the destruction of the dating market. People used to meet their prospective relationships in person in events like church, college, youth groups, and the like, and that generally worked out because people tend to breed through their caste, whether through class, ethnic, religious, or whatever groups. However, all of these have largely been replaced by online dating. Online dating and free love by extension doesn't work. If you put men and women in a room to decide who they'll fuck, 80% of women will compete for 20% of men. In college campuses, we normally find there are a couple classes. Firstly, most men who get no action, a small group of men who sleep with most women. However, this isn't an arrangement that goes well given that the women never end up in relationships that they want. Most men get no action, and even for the guys on top, it's not emotionally fulfilling. Many of my best friends are players, and every single time, after a certain point they realize that it's meaningless and they're basically just doing it to masturbate with girls' bodies. If you're lonely, I wouldn't blame you too much. There's not really a correlation between social skills or loneliness. I have lots of connections in industries like entertainment, tech, and finance, and I want to make clear that the most charismatic, successful guys in our society struggle with this, so you're not alone. A good friend of mine's a professional socialite. This is a person who cultivates a massive social network, and... That's basically what her life's work is. She once confided in me that she was lonely, and hearing that shocked me, because if this person's lonely, who isn't? I once found that social crises occur when the average marriage rate goes above 28, since humans are inherently biological, and upon having significant parts of our population have no possibility for immortality, the society starts to fall apart and you have events like the English Civil War, Russian Civil War, or Taiping Rebellion. The thing you need to understand here is that addictions are like little demons in your spirit that drive you crazy in little ways as they possess more and more of your personality. When you wonder why retarded shit happens in the modern world, whether social justice puritanism, school shooters, or QAnon, look at people who have become addicted to something while also falling through the social cracks. Just keep in mind the years to come that the norm has been to become crazy and you want to keep your head above it. The digital world by poking holes into our subconscious makes us less happy. You have to remember that these companies are incentivized to get your attention and not really much else. Thus, the things that get your attention are the things that were vital to your survival in the tribal world, like violence, sex, and disgust. Thus, we're paraded with images of attractive members of the other sex we will never be able to sleep with, political concepts that alienate us, and horrible events that terrify us. This puts us in a permanent state of fear and psychological arousal. This actually had profound effects upon Gen Z in its childhood. Television had become competitive in the 1980s and 90s, and the way networks stayed competitive was basically by pandering fear. This meant they obsessively focused on crime and things like serial killers, while in reality, the murder and violent crime rates were hitting the lowest in American history. Gen Z grew up in a near purda environment in which kids were often not allowed to play outside alone. Children were shepherded around from event to event and the like. I was kind of weird in that I was given a lot of independence as a kid, where I'd basically dick around in high school and get experiences while most of my peers had highly regimented schedules to prepare them for college, while their parents didn't give them a lot of independence when they were young for fear of them. And I mean, this makes sense from the parents' perspective, given that from an evolutionary standpoint, as they had less children and those children would face worse competition, while they also knew less of their neighbors and trusted their communities less, to shepherd and protect their progeny as their only route to immortality. However, this has gone too far with lots of Gen Z's sky-high anxiety rates coming from not being able to experience the world for themselves to get experience to feel comfortable with the challenges they face as adults. There's a fascinating book called The Coddling of the American Mind that shows how this overparenting has resulted in the political radicalism and mental health problems amongst Gen Z, either through not being able to control their own anxiety or through wanting political forces to guide them since they haven't been able to mature sufficiently as individuals to protect themselves. This trend especially worries me given that when you look at despotisms in history, they're often buttressed by social isolation and fragmentation. Freedom is maintained by strong individuals, communities, and values that keep despotisms at bay. Look at the poverty and corruption of southern Italy or how tyrannies in Asia were driven by societies where families would rarely associate outside of their social network and lived in clans. If we want our freedoms to survive, we need to be able to stem this. Part 3. Nihilism one of the things I hear from a lot of older folks is that young people are just lifeless. They try to hire younger people or interact with them, only to see that the young people have no enthusiasm, no drive to life or initiative. Much as it hates me to rat out my own people, I kind of agree, at least for a lot of Gen Z. It honestly makes sense, at least with the factors discussed above, in that why would you have motivation if you're not going to get anywhere, or you're an opium addict to social media? 
However, there's a bigger factor that I think drives this, the remarkable cynicism and nihilism that takes hold ideologically among the young. If you talk to young people today, they're beyond belief in anything except the most fervent worship of the most ardent ideologies. They don't believe in capitalism, liberalism, freedom, religion of any sort, rationality, themselves, or anything except extremist political ideologies. However, even those ideologies are built off cynicism. I find it one of the most bizarre and amusing events in history that postmodernism, an ideology that literally says ideologies and worldviews are bad, has spawned the most puritanical and intolerant ideology of our time, which is social justice. I think it's that since they believe they understand how crooked other ideologies are, they are beyond worrying about it and could just make up their own ideology. They don't call themselves a religion, but neither did early Christians who called themselves the truth. Postmodernism became the dominant trend in the educational world after the 1960s, and with postmodernism's goal to try to poke holes in other ideologies, it removes any ideological planks people could use to order their lives. Life in the human condition is generally pretty terrifying. We live in an infinite game where chaos keeps on throwing random shit at us. We always end up being inevitably wrong, and no matter what we do, we die. Culture and faith is what keeps us trudging along. Ripping apart culture is ripping apart the walls that keep out the chaos of death and horror. We found that religion is one of the things that makes people the happiest, and thus discounting religion at the expense of secular ideologies that have horrible historical precedents is just dumb. I'm not hating on atheists. Atheists have the best argument of anyone today, but for atheists to try to tear down religion, they need to create something capable of filling religion's void, which none are capable of yet. When you remove meaning from young people's lives, you remove their ability to believe in things beyond their own suffering. The cynicism inherent in social justice and postmodernism is that individual action cannot matter. Any disparities are driven by oppression with no interplaying actions from the oppressed or anything they can do about it. Telling someone to lose weight is fat shaming, telling the impoverished to improve themselves is triggering, and telling people to behave with honor is considered cringe. This is an ideology like so many others across history that attempts to take responsibility out of individual hands and judge people purely based off the group identities they were born with. Just look at how many attempts at self-improvement among young men are mocked. To read makes you a nerd, to work out makes you a brat or a jock, to try to improve yourself morally makes you a neo-Nazi. If you want to become richer and more successful, you're perpetuating aggressive, toxic masculinity. However, the way you make people miserable is by telling them they have no responsibility or control over their lives. In the worst conditions, the idea that you can do nothing is the idea that will kill you. If your friend's in opioid withdrawal, don't tell them the pain will never end and there's nothing they can do. Tell them to grit their teeth, not kill themselves, and bear the suffering until it's gone. Look at the Jews and Gypsies. Both groups faced unimaginable discrimination in the old world. However, the Jews took responsibility for their actions and started to learn skills, so they became wealthy in the worst conditions. Meanwhile, the gypsies did none of that and remain poor to this day. The philosophy of our times is in effect anti-life. I don't think that's controversial given that a quarter of young people don't want to have children due to climate change. This is an ideology that tries to squash every successful group, whether celebrities, men, white people, Asians, and drag them down to the lowest common denominator. An ideology that constructs bizarre logical arguments so that the successful groups in society must always be in sin. As an example, if I say I'm proud of my heritage as a white American, I'll be called a fascist. As a counterpoint, one of the biggest socialist YouTubers called me a white supremacist for saying Christianity is integral to Western civilization's formation. I think it's telling this ideology says truth and good don't exist, while trying to tear down statues, rewrite history books while changing stories so the good characters are bad and vice versa. I think it's telling that it tells both sexes to ignore their biologies, and that's a horrible decision. If men do anything in the slightest masculine, they get called Nazis or part of toxic masculinity. Girls, meanwhile, have immense social pressure to conform to feminist stereotypes of the overworked girl boss. Girls are shoved into male-dominated workforces and culture while going through a hookup culture that leaves them feeling gross and violated. I think social planners and the power-hungry want to disturb any natural connections, whether biological or cultural, to make us all into interchangeable cogs to give them more power. I would split young people into three categories, which is a gross oversimplification, but I'm going to do it anyway. There are those who worship the altar of radical ideologies, whether right or left, but more so the left, and have it take over their personalities. As Jordan Peterson says, People don't have ideas, ideas have people. 
The second group is those who really don't care and just want to get on with their lives and let radicals do whatever they want. The third and the smallest group is free thinkers who have taken the red pill in the traditional sense and come from all over the political spectrum. You've got to keep in mind that for young people, they were raised in an environment in which, due to radical leftists taking over the educational system, things that their parents would view as insane were treated as first principle truths. I remember thinking at age 9, everyone gets called a racist, so why does it matter a tremendous amount if anyone does? A good friend of mine is a school teacher, and he said that kids in my age group were generally cynical about social justice. However, for the kids five years younger than me, they viewed it not cynically, almost as a religious document that should be viewed without questioning. On the other side, you have the radicalized right, which is a weird collection of bizarre points of view such as the manosphere, the alt-right, and the way less radical groups like Jordan Peterson, all of which really share nothing except hatred of social justice. The thing social justice people don't understand is that the more they push, the more they create the backlash that will kill them. The left has radicalized the right. Part 4. Gen Z's Adulthood I see Gen Z largely divided into two categories, those who have lost their way and those who are overachievers. In Gen Z, you really see those that have given up with the hope vanished from their eyes and those who are remarkable. It's crazy to see 21-year-olds form multi-million dollar crypto funds, form tech companies become internet experts in topics and kingpins, being politically active and really punching above their weight. There's an African saying that if the young men aren't given a place in the village, they'll burn it down to feel its warmth. That's so young people in Gen Z being put in a sinking spiral of economic, political, environmental, and social problems feel. For older people, just keep the young in mind and don't discount them or their opinions out of hand. If you don't, they'll make sure history blackens your names. The ship is sinking, but we can all band together to make sure we pump out the water. You don't have to be doing something impressive to be a young person and not be lost in the future. The deck is stacked against you, and if you're failing, that's okay. I was a loser for most of my life. Just hold out until you get an opportunity and take it for all you can. I promise that things will get better. The world's fundamentals aren't broken and we might get through a lot of shit in order to get there, but I have confidence that we can handle it. Bad things, whether financial crashes, wars, or disease, are probably on our way, but just remember that your great-grandparents fought in the world wars. I think lots of Gen Z will get stuck, lost in an era of failure of nihilism that screwed them over, even not being able to fully acclimate to better conditions when they come. These are the women whose sweethearts died in World War I and still were in a rut in the 1950s. The only two things you need to get through any bad situation are wisdom and courage. Keep your minds open and fill your hearts with bravery and you'll be able to weather any crisis in the castle of your mind. What a feltist and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check me out on Pearl that I'm launching this weekend, or Pillar, as well as Patreon, where I've got the first couple hundred pages of my cultural history of America and history of the world. As always, thanks so much for watching, and have a great day.